Hello, hello, and welcome to our next FODMAP chat session. Today, we are talking about FODMAP stacking. This is one of our biggest FAQs and such a confusing topic for lots of people. My name is Alana Scott. I'm the founder of A Little Bit Yummy, and joining me today is Chloe Sweeney from the Monash FODMAP dietitian team. Hello, Chloe. Hi, Alana. Thanks for having me again. Oh, you're welcome. It's always such a pleasure having you on the show. Now, format stacking can be quite a controversial topic, and some of the newbies listening in might have no idea what we are talking about. So can you start us off at a really high level and tell us what is format stacking? Yeah, sure. So yeah, it's definitely confusing, definitely a common question. So uh, I guess the whole concept is about you know, when you're eating multiple servings of foods or you're the green serving of food, that the potential chance of it sort of stacking up and eventually causing you symptoms. So we obviously have these green low FODMAP cutoffs. So it may contain a small amount of FODMAPs, but it's not enough to cause the symptoms. So stacking might be you're eating a lots of those little, you know, tiny bits of FODMAPs that don't cause you symptoms. But once you've had a lot of them, it may tip over your tolerance edge and you end up having this symptom. So it's that stacking of small, small amounts of FODMAPs to cause a symptom in the end that you weren't really expecting. Okay, so that's gonna feel a little overwhelming for anyone who's just started the low FODMAP diet. So do most of us need to worry about this FODMAP stacking concept? That's the key thing we really want people to know is that no, FODMAP stacking is not something that we want people to get hung up on, especially when you're just starting out on the diet as well. So our green light servings, these, these low FODMAP servings, they're really conservative. We want people to consume meals. We understand people don't eat to single foods all the time. We're having meals. So we want people to be combining foods. So these conservative amounts should mean that you can eat multiple green servings of foods without having an issue. We really want people to have this as a consideration if they just can't seem to shake the symptoms. So that first elimination phase of the diet can go from two to six weeks. So if you're getting to that six week time or longer and you just can't seem to get rid of all of these symptoms, then maybe stacking might be something to consider. But otherwise, most people with these IBS issues or, you know, on the FODMAP diet won't even need to think of stacking in their whole diet overall. Oh, that's a relief. I'm sure a lot <laughs> of people will feel really confident about that. So the take home message I just got is like, do your first, you know, three to four weeks or even six weeks. If you've got good symptom reduction, then that's great. You don't need to worry about it. Just continue on as you are. Think about hitting that reintroduction phase and starting to test those FODMAP groups. But if you're troubling, then troubleshooting needs to happen. And this might be something that you want to consider. Exactly so right. you keep mentioning green light serves. For anyone who's not familiar with the Monash University FODMAP app, what do you mean by green light serve? And are there other colours that they need to be mindful of? <laughs> Definitely. So when I'm talking about green light serves, this is in our food guide within our app. So the food guide is what we do. We've taken these foods, we've tested them in our lab, and we've assigned them a FODMAP rating. So we have cutoffs for all the different FODMAPs. So your fructans, your fructose, your sorbitol, that sort of stuff. They all have cutoffs of when they're going to cause us symptoms. So the green light is a, a rating that we've given when we say this food contains this amount, a good amount of FODMAP that's not going to cause you a symptom. Then our other ratings, we've got amber, so that moderate level where it may cause symptoms in some people. So you're reaching into an area where symptoms might arise. And then you've got our red light, so that's our high. So for most people with IBS, or particularly those who have intolerances to those certain FODMAPs, you're likely going to get symptoms. So we have these different ratings to really give you an understanding of, you know, you might be able to eat this much of a food, but eating this much of a food will cause you symptoms. So I guess the key thing is you can still eat foods that contain FODMAPs, so it can have a red serving at some point, but look at that green serving size. It's got that smaller amount of FODMAPs that's not going to cause you symptoms. You don't have to avoid foods completely. Lists that say avoid this food, maybe not that great of a list. Look at something that gives you a <laughs> serving size um, where you can have a smaller amount that's not going to cause you these symptoms. So um, that's where it all comes from in that app, that green light serving. You can combine a multiple of those because that's a really conservative quantity. Um, you can combine them safely without symptoms occurring. Fantastic. That's really good to know. So when we're talking about this FODMAP stacking concept, are we looking at it in isolation? So like one meal, or are we looking at it over the course of an entire day? 
The great thing is it's only per meal. So if you had to count, you know, FODMAPs like you do maybe like a calorie counting thing over a whole day, that's so burdensome. We don't want people doing that. So when we're thinking about, you know, FODMAP stacking or a FODMAP, how much we're eating of FODMAPs, it's in every single meal. Because if you think about it, think about our digestive system. We'll eat our breakfast, it'll go into our stomach, then our small intestine, large intestine, that sort of thing. But if we leave enough time between that meal and the next, it's already moved on to the next part of the digestive system. So they're not crossing over and they're not stacking, that sort of thing. So if we say about two to three hours between each meal is a good time for us to sort of reset, I guess, and we can move on to that next sort of meal containing small amounts of FODMAPs again. Great. Um, so if we're leaving two to three hours, that's fantastic. What if you're like me? And you're like this constant grazer throughout the day where you're like, you have breakfast and then maybe you snack on something else within sort of like an hour and a half and then you have morning tea and then you snack on something else and then it's lunchtime. Do you have some basic tips for us on how to make the most out of our regular meals so that we don't feel the need to constantly snack and then we can make the most of our like breakfast, have a gap, morning tea, have a gap you know, lunch, afternoon, tea, dinner, that sort of meal spacing throughout the day. Yeah, definitely. I'm I'm 100% with you. I'm a snacker as well. You can't keep me to three meals a day. Um, so I guess the key thing is what you're making your meals up with. So we want to make meals filling where possible. So um, protein containing foods are high protein foods. These are things that fill you up um, really well. So we want to be making sure we've got enough protein in our meals and also fiber. So fiber, just like protein, really fills us up. So finding some low FODMAP um, fiber options and trying to pack our meals with these in those low FODMAP servings um, is a really great way to keep us feeling that bit fuller for longer. So we're not feeling like after half an hour, we need another snack already. Um, but another option is if you if you like snacking, I personally just like grazing, whether I'm hungry, I'm not, unfortunately, um, but it's finding those really low FODMAP snacks, things that you can sort of safely eat in between. So um, our protein containing foods are naturally low FODMAP. So maybe you like a tin of tuna. Some people just like eating a tin of tuna. Um, carrot is another great vegetable mm. that's got pretty much no FODMAPs in it. So having carrot sticks with maybe some like an eggplant dip, you can add a low FODMAP size, size of, of the dip. Um, a, a firm banana, um, some popcorn, a handful of nuts. So looking in the app, finding those foods that pretty much only have a green light and you can, you know, feel pretty safe in having that between your meals and not be triggering symptoms as well because it's got trace, trace, tiny, tinsy amounts of FODMAPs, <laughs> if any at all. Um, so it's just those safe servings in between all those really filling meals are great ways to get us through the day. Oh, those are fabulous tips. I know that as nations, we are pretty poor at getting our fiber in per day. So this is a really good reminder that, you know, you want to be hitting those two servings of like low FODMAP fruit and your sort of three to five servings of low FODMAP vegetables throughout your day and sort of spreading them out, which brings me to my next point. So Chloe, I know lots of people like to sit down with a bowl of fruit um, that's low FODMAP, but they might have like two or diff three different serves of fruit in that one meal. Is this a problem in terms of FODMAP stacking? We would really recommend where possible sort of spreading your fruit out. So having a few different fruits, but over the day. So save, you know, your serving of fruit for the morning um, and then one for your afternoon tea or dessert or something like that. Instead of having them all together, because um, there's a higher chance, I guess, that a problem could occur. If, if you like having more of a fruit salad type of thing, have maybe half a serve of fruit of each. So like half of a banana um, and then, you know, one or two strawberries or something like that. And then later on in the day, you can have a little bit more. So it's spreading out those sort of serves of fruit. Um, they're great then to have those snacks in between your meals, um, but also then you're not, you know, having any potential issues of having too much fruit at once either. Those are such great tips and definitely be careful if you're a smoothie fan because it is so easy to do FODMAP stacking in the form of a smoothie. So just, yeah. just, just be mindful if you are still experiencing symptoms and you're having a smoothie per day, that might be somewhere to go and reconsider. And there are low FODMAP smoothie options out there. So that, that would definitely be getting as well. Okay. So my next question for you is when we are thinking about our meal you've just talked about you know splitting our fruit we want to have our serves of vegetables per day and you've also talked about how the app is conservative so if i was to build my meal and maybe choose my palm sized piece of protein so whether that's like chicken fish beef lamb seafood or you know tofu or tempeh if i'm 
going down the vegetarian route, can I then combine that with like a serving of carbohydrates? So that might be, you know, a slice of low format bread. It could be, you know, some rice. It might be some potato. It might be some gluten-free pasta. And then on top of that, could I add, say, two or three low format vegetables in that green rated serve? Would that be considered, you know, pretty standard, pretty normal and pretty okay from a FODMAP stacking standpoint. Definitely. The, the key thing we want people to do is we, we want people to limit as much food as like, sorry, avoid limiting as much food as possible. So looking for those green serves, it might have a red serve because they might have a few vegetables that have, you know, high FODMAPs and higher quantities, but you could have three different vegetables all in their green serves in one meal and be okay. We want people to get you know, they're five serves of veggies a day. We don't expect you to eat five separate meals with veggies in them. We're happy. We want people to be combining these veggies in one meal and their carbohydrates sort of serve um, in those green low FODMAP ratings. You can safely put them together um, without any issues. And then you get, you know, you, you write nutrition from all of these different um, servings as well. So definitely go for it. Combine these foods in their green servings. And just remember, your body is going to tell you what you tolerate as well. So if you exactly. eat something and I'm not sure, you know, just make a note and you can test that theory when you come back to the FODMAP reintroduction phase as well. Definitely. Cool. Awesome. Okay. So we've talked about some great topics here. I know that we'll have some listeners here feeling overwhelmed going, hello, I'm one of those people who is still having symptoms after, you know, three, four, five weeks on the diet. What would you say is the next step for, for those people? Yeah, sure. I guess the key thing is making sure you're recording what you're eating first. So we've got the diary in the app. So write down what you're eating, write down what your symptoms are. So you can have a record of that. And then we, we always really high rec highly recommend where accessible, um, reaching out to a dietitian. So we've got a directory of dietitians on our website um, that are trained um, by us in the sort of FODMAP diet. And then you can take your food and your symptom records to these dietitians. They can really help you make sense of what's going on. Um, they're really well versed in you know, the timings of when symptoms might come on. Um, and they're really good at listening to you and figuring out, you know, what feels strange in your body as well. So um, they can assess whether stacking is the problem. Maybe it's not the problem. Maybe there's something else that's going on that might need investigating as well. So um, don't, don't feel like you have to do this by yourself try and get that help from a dietitian and also the FODMAP community. There's a lot of obviously great groups on Facebook, um, our page as well, and emailing us. We're always happy to try and sort of work through um, things with you as well. And so are people with the same experiences on groups. So reaching out to your dietitian, reaching out to the FODMAP community, getting that guidance and just know that you're not alone. It is scary when you're going through this phase one, cutting things out, symptoms are overwhelming, um, but definitely just seek support. Don't feel like you have to do this on your own. People can help you figure out whether stacking is the option or is the you know, issue um, or whether we need to start investigating other things. That makes really good sense. Your dietitians are your best friend in this point. <laughs> um, in this case, they, they really get to know you and they get to sort of be that detective for your gut mm, symptoms as well. Definitely. Um, so thank you so much for answering all these common questions today, Chloe. If you are currently listening into us and you have another FODMAP stacking question, then feel free to leave that in the comments below. We will respond to you and give you some more help and guidance as needed too. Now, if you'd like to support the amazing work Monash University does, then you can go and download their Monash University FODMAP diet app from the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store. And now, Chloe, I hear there is another FODMAP stacking resource on the market now as well. Do you want to just briefly tell us what that is? Yeah, sure. So we've got our brand new cookbook out um, and something that we've done to help people really combine the recipes in the cookbook um, is our new stacked cup resource. So we've, um, you know, from the research figured out people's sort of tolerance of how much FODMAPs they can consume. And so we've then allocated what uh, a band of this stacked cup um, to the different recipes. So this helps you combine them. So there might be a main meal that has these two bands. Um, and then you might choose a side that has another two bands to get to the four bands of your stacked cup. So it helps you combine recipes in our cookbook. And so the stacked cup is also going to be rolled out over our website and also our app as well. Awesome. That's going to be another lovely resource too. Don't forget, if you need more FODMAP resources as well, there is the monashfodmap.com 
website that has lots of blog articles, recipes, and other tips. And then there is also a littlebityummy.com, which is full of recipes, resources, and articles too. So make sure you go and explore those resources. Let us know if you have questions, and we can't wait to see you in our next FODMAP chat session. Chloe, thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thanks again, Alana. Bye, everyone.